Okay, we're going to get going here. How many of you in here own a copy of this book? Anybody? A few of you? There's a whole set of tables in the back. Well, not that far. Past the middle. And it starts with group one supply fittings, but we have tape fitting after fitting. And of course, I can't put them all up there. But these are our equivalent lengths, or a TEL total equivalent length is, is determined based on these tables. So let's start with the standard, what we see in a standard furnace lots of times. Here's our furnace and coil blowing up, and we put a T on top, and goes both ways. And if they put just a square turn here and here, and the height versus those, this width is a ratio of about 0.5, so this is like 10 inches or 8 inches, and this is 16 to 20 inches. The equivalent length of the air making that band is 120 feet. That's a big number, isn't it? Now, when I was early in my HVAC career, my boss took me out to install an air conditioner up in Pepperwood, which is the gated community up there on the southeast part of the valley. And he said, this duct system has some problems. He says, I went and looked at it. We were adding air conditioning. And he said, so we're going to put a bigger motor on it. He said, we'll see what that does. So it had, not exactly like this, it was, it was more like this, or this, just a square elbow, and all the air went one direction. Well, it really doesn't matter if it's going two directions or one direction. If you have to make that sharp 90 right off the furnace, it's going to be 120 feet of length. And that's what we had. So we put this big motor in it, and this was belt drive days. Those are olden days. And with a belt drive, you can change the motor, and then you change the pulley or the shiv on the motor so you can adjust it out. You're nodding your head yeah. so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And by doing that, what do you do? You speed up the fan, right? Because the drive pulley is bigger. So we put like a one and a half horsepower motor on it and ramped it up. And guess what it did? It almost shut down. The airflow dropped. It didn't go up. Why was that? Because the faster you threw the air at it, the greater the turbulence where it was trying to make the turn. And it literally was reducing the duct to where it was only like this <clears throat> tall. And so air, you don't fix stuff by throwing more velocity and more power at it. You just make it worse. So all these equivalent lengths are based on, um, I think they say it in there, they're based on between seven and 900 feet per minute. So it's a relatively low velocity duct. Um, now, if it was one to one, if this was higher, then it's 85 feet of duct. But what happens if we put these little turning vanes in the duct? We go from 120 down to 20. Is that a slight improvement? Like a huge improvement. Same thing happens here. If we radius our elbow a little bit and then put turning veins in, we can drop it down pretty far. Um, So that we have two, we have two options. I just seen which slides I have. Turning veins, which are just little veins that you install inside the duct, or we start doing a radius on the elbow. And we'll get a little further on, and we'll see that the size of the radius we put on it, the larger the radius or the more gradual the sweep, the less resistance we have going around it. 
Has anybody looked at the dryer vent tables that are in the IRC? And it tells you if you use one of those long sweeping elbows, it almost is no resistant. You don't have to deduct a lot. This is the exact same stuff as we do on dryer vents to try to keep the airflow up. And I just included in the selected pages. So here's a smooth elbow, like that dryer vent elbow, depending on the radius, the larger the radius, the lower the equivalent length. Here's our standard elbow that can go from 30 down to 15, depending on the radius. And here's our 35 foot three piece elbow. What happens if you just take two ducts and miter it 75 feet? So we have some pretty big numbers here. Um, so let's let's look at these. This table is a little bit harder to read, but if we look at this elbow, we call this a flat or a hard bend elbow. It says mitered. R equals zero. What does that mean? So we have no radius, so it's a square elbow. The picture really doesn't show it, but if we have no radius, it's 90 feet of equivalent length. So you have a duct system, you see it going down and it has three square elbows. There's 270 feet of equivalent length before you even maybe just got out of the furnace room or something like that. But if they put a sweeping radius of at least 0.5, the radius is based on the width of the duct. Um, we can drop it down to 20. If we're not a flat elbow, but what I call a vertical or an easy band, you can drop by down to 10 by putting the radius in it. If you do a radius and turning veins, you can even drop them down to five because we're helping the air make that band. So what's happening is a lot of these HVAC people are hiring someone to do their load. They look at the tables, they look at the filters and all that stuff, and they tell me we have to put good elbows in it for it to work, for them to get a passing load calculation out. And so they design it that way, and then what does the contract do? He puts it in with square elbows. And so we have this huge equivalent length in our duct system and we don't get any airflow. And then they blame you for their system not working because you did what? You made them do a load calculation and it says it's supposed to be two and a half. So they want to put in a three and a half or a four ton, but if they don't fix the duct, they're going to have the same problem. In fact, they're going to have a bigger problem if they don't increase the duct for the bigger air conditioner. That makes sense? The larger capacity of the air conditioner, the greater the airflow. Minimum 400 CFM per ton of air conditioning. And if you don't get it, you don't get the full capacity out of it you have. Does so everybody see how these elbows work? It's, it's really a big change, like going from 90 down to 20 or even 10. Um, see, here's our elbows again. Four piece elbow, it's 30 to 35, depending on how sharp they sweep it. Square elbows, at least 80. Now, you'll have contractors tell you or people tell you, well, I radius the outside. It really doesn't make any difference. Because here's an elbow. It's a square elbow. As the air comes through it, it's dead in that corner anyway. So if I put a radius on it, it really doesn't change it if I do a radius on the outside of the elbow. It's doing it on the inside here to eliminate this. Can you tell on installed duct if those fins are installed? 
If there's turning veins in there, you are going to, this turning vein stuff, they have what they call vein rail. And it's metal that's like this wide, it has these little dimples with slots, and you fit the veins all in it, and you put it in as a, as a unit. And you will see screws right through this area on the elbow where they hold that in place. And you can push off, up on it, and you can feel the solid in there because those very few are putting them in. Very, very few. I always like, on, on commercial stuff, we always did that, but on residential stuff, I always like the radius elbow because it's a little tough to put these in a duct that's only 12 inches wide or 8 inches wide or 10 inches wide because you, you know, you're limited in this in the space to put it in. This has been around for, it was around when I started doing it 50 years ago, so it's nothing new. It's just that we aren't making anybody do it. Single thickness turning veins, you can see what they do. They drop it way down. That boot that goes on the end, 80 feet. Okay, this was, when I bought my house that I'm in right now, this is how my duct was ran to my upper floor. I have a two-story house. And so you see the furnace face to the left, and they made the duct a little bit taller going to the back. And that was only like 18 inches from the furnace to where they took off the top of the duct turned in the joist, came and then went up two stories, and then another turn in the attic, and then they took all the, the runs off there. When we bought the house, and I knew it was screwed up, my wife just fell in love with the house. It has the long front covered porch, you know, I mean, that shed porch and the three dormers and, and everything. And she said, you can fix that, can't you? I said, yeah, I can. But we moved in in like August, September, and then, you know, we just had a few days of cooling, but by the next summer, we were like eight degrees hotter upstairs. What do you, th well, yeah, I already told you what the equivalent length was. 465 feet of equivalent length before I had a, a branch coming off to go to one of the upper rooms. Now, where's, where did we get that? The first turn, what's this one? How many feet? 120 feet, right? And then the air's going this way, what do I have to do? I have to turn it up, right? So that's between 80 and 90 feet. We'll call it 80. But then what do I have to do? I have to turn it this way. There's another 80, then I have to turn it 80. And then I have to get up the top and I turn 80 again. And then I take the flex decks off and run it out to the rooms. So, what do you think I did? I didn't put it in the furnace. Just, just changed the, made it straight up. The first thing I did is I tore it out and moved the furnace back two feet. What did that do? So much. Top floor goes straight up. And then these two elbows going for the main floor in the basement, I put a radius throat on those. But this duct that's going all the way up, and I have to have this offset simply because what's upstairs, it's, you know, it's in a pantry in my kitchen. And actually I remodeled up there and I took it so it went straight up and then it turns at the ceiling of the first floor and then goes up. So it comes right off the top, so I eliminated that turn, the two turns here, it goes up, it has two elbows, but what did I do to the two elbows? I put turning veins in them. So my duct going to the attic now has two 10 or 20 feet of equivalent length elbows and then just length the duct. So I went from 465 down to 
fifty or something like that. You think my upstairs works better now? Absolutely. Completely changed the whole thing. And I cut in some transfer grills in the bedrooms so that I had a return path back to the furnace. How hard would it have been for them to do it right? I didn't have to do anything downstairs. It was in a furnace room that I, I had the room. I just moved the furnace back. Sometimes, the, um, well, you don't have to have the knowledge of this to be an HVAC contractor. Unfortunately, it's you guys are with, faced with the responsibility of training people, aren't you? How many framers have you trained? <laughs> How many framers have you taught what fire blocking is or what, yeah, a number of things. Where foundation bolts need to be and the list goes on and on and on. This doesn't look bad, does it? I mean, if you look at it. You know, I think where they run into trouble is exactly that, is the framing. Because what when the heat guy shows up, it's done. And you can't run that plenum right through a pantry, right? So what do they do? They offset it two feet, run it up through a chase. And then, so all that stuff in the same way with coming down under a beam, right? Instead of headering that off, dropping it down in the floor, where it should have been, they've held it up. Yeah. So it's, yeah, but they don't understand the principles we just talked about. Right. So if they had understood this principle, I mean, after you've heard me describe this, what would you say? Well, cut the furnace be back here. And it could. Right. I mean, I literally, it was not, a, I had plenty of room in there. They had, the people we bought from just had storage sitting behind the furnace right there. And I mean, I didn't have to move a wall downstairs. My furnace room was enclosed. I just slid it back, changed the T, and added some turning vanes. It's because they didn't understand basic duct design. How much of that is, I mean, obviously we show up for a four-way inspection and that's all installed, ready to... Yeah. So, basically we just have to say, you, it's got to be to the design in this. It needs so to if be. it doesn't match this. It's got to be relatively close to that design. And mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit more about that because that design that you have in your hand right there tells you what the fittings are. Yeah, it calls out each one of them. It calls out each fitting and, you know... I've been doing these types of classes for like 11 years now um, for code officials and for contractors. And I do them all the time for the Rocky Mountain Gas Association, which is contractors. Um, but we don't get the, the people in here that we need, you know, in the classes. And it's a big job for you guys to try to, try to teach them, but I'm hoping that you get some little bits and pieces so that you can take that design that they submitted. And you might have to tell them, well, do you have a manual B? And so, I mean, what's a fitting that you can read off there? Uh, looks like the main trunk one's an 8E. So 8E, I go to, to here. And that's the, that's the term. Yeah, and we have, I think I have this one in here. It's right there. Yeah. But I can, I can virtually guarantee you that when the contractor installed it, he did not install an AD. Right? He probably did an AD. Or he did an AD or something. Or something, with it. something similar. So those, that's what that was going to be my question. So these, these numbers refer to the, the book. That's where you find that, what those are. Yeah. I have talked with Brightsoft and I said, can you um, create a report that prints out a visual representation of the fittings? Wouldn't that be great? So if it says it's an AE, then there's a sheet that says, here's an AE fitting. It's not a really complicated system. Once I mean, it, in four or five hours, we've covered a lot of material. 
And it, doesn't it make sense? Let's keep going. So you be above going above and beyond to request that of the primary stage to say, hey, simplify my job and the bills that I have to take through my manual leave. Can you guys provide these fitting over here? You know, I, I think it might be. Because that would be super beneficial. It would be really beneficial. You know, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you you should copy all the pages out of Manual D so you have that, but maybe you, you do have a few. I think that's a great idea. I also think it's amazing how much pushback you get just for asking for the Manual J and D. We'll come to the house. Now. Yeah. Right? And so. Well, engineers cut and paste generic crap all the time. Like yeah. Structural and things like that. Yeah. So I don't see why it's above and beyond asking. And that's a I, good direction to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what Rightsoft says because. Right soft now, you might have seen the sheet that comes on the front of them, that that summary page. They added that summary page after myself and a couple other guys across the country created our own summary page. In fact, I think Midway used to have my summary yeah. page, right? Yep. And now you see when Right soft prints one that has the same information, doesn't it? Yep. And um, so, you know, that's a good thought. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push and see if Manual J has the capability, I mean, right side, to just print it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It'd make it 10 times easier for us. Like I said, I, yeah. I'm in the building 95% of the time. And you have a whole bunch of inspection that I get. It. I mean, I used to go into the, I didn't even go in. I just download my inspections from home, head right out in the field, and I'd have 15 inspections. How much time do you have to? That's every day, all day, for the past five yeah. years. It's all the time. Well, that's why I love my city inspect. It's all digital. Yep. You can pull up every bit of document you need on that software. Not that I'm promoting it by any means, but that's what yeah. I use. And so it's it what makes it that? very convenient. The my city inspector. That's, that's what we use also. It's um, you can pull up all of those documents out in the field on your tablet. Let's real quick and, and we'll keep that thought and we're gonna keep talking about it. let's real quick go through this example right here. And I have I printed a copy of this for everybody, but in, with time, I'm just going to ask for your input. And then someone, can you add up these numbers? Someone have a calculator or something? Maybe two of you. Add up these numbers as we go. So here's a here's a duct system, and we want to figure the total equivalent length to here. From here. Now this is just the supply. We'd have a return system. We'd have to do two. So we have a three foot piece of ducted A. So three feet. How many feet is B? 120. It's the first one, right? So 120, five feet, 80 feet, 10 feet, 80 feet, 15 feet, 80 feet. Eight feet, and I didn't put that one in there, but this one is 65 feet. I didn't, I didn't include the, the sheet from Manual D. This is 15 feet, and what was that one? 80. So what's our total? Four something? 561. Huh? 561. 561. What happens when we do this? Three feet, 20 feet, five feet, and I don't care if you add it up, 20 feet, we put veins in at 10 feet. So maybe the easy thing is minus 100, minus 60, minus 60, minus 60, right? Say that again. Minus, minus 180. We add up somewhere around 200. Yeah. Yeah. No. If we had time, yes, sir. I would have given you these two pages and said, add, write them down and add them up. But it's, you can see what I'm saying. And really, this doesn't look that bad when we're looking at it. If it's nice and straight and everything and sealed well, we think, well, that's a nice duct system. Great duct system. 
So does this boil down to sheer knowledge on the installers? Yep, exactly. Are those things more expensive, that ducks? They're, these are a little more expensive to fabricate, and the manufacturers won't make them. It just irritates the hell out of me that they won't make them. When I, okay, when I first started in HVAC, I worked for another company, and I worked there for 11 years, and we made our own duct. And they grew and grew, and so they built a new big building, and they had a sheet metal shop, and they had guys that just made their duct for all of us. And my boss at that time, and it's the same guy that we went out and tried to put that air conditioner, and he decided, and we weren't going to do this much work on every job, but we were doing low couch and stuff. He said, we're just going to make radius fittings for all of our elbows. And so we fabricated in our shop this type of elbow. And we made all of our own duct. Well, when I started my business, I bought all my sheet metal equipment, and I made my duct, and I made that type of elbow. Well, it got to where it was cheaper for me to buy straight duct that was already manufactured than it was just to buy the steel, let alone shape it and everything. So I started buying manufactured straight duct, but all the manufacturers want to make those square-throated elbows. And so I kept making my elbows. So we fabricated our elbows and we bought our straight duct. And so it's either turning veins or radius throat elbows if you want it to work. And that's how they're designing them, but they're not putting them in that way. I'm going to have so many fights next week when I do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you know what? I think, I think what you need is, do you have a copy manual, D? I do. You probably ought to open it up and, yeah, and, probably would have been a good idea. and spend a little time and getting yourself a little familiar with it. It's like a bike You know, but they, th those are the problems. That's where the problems come. Have you ever heard of someone say, well, air conditioners just freeze. you got to learn that what it freezes. You turn on the fan and you shut off the cooling and let it thaw. And, you know, air conditioners don't freeze if you build your duct system high. Change your filter. And you change your filter and you keep the charge right. They, they do not freeze. It's always, it's, it's that Dirty A coils or yep. design drones or they didn't charge it. There's yep, there's there's a reason. And I've heard so many times they say, well, air conditioners just freeze and you just that's BS. They, they don't. Um, and guess what else? If you don't have enough airflow, does anybody know how the refrigerant system works? We push liquid refrigerant into the house and it evaporates in the coil. Produces cooling, we absorb the heat out of the house and transport it back outside and discharge it out of the condensing unit. It's just like your propane bottle on your grill. If you run that grill for a little, all day long, or you're out camping or something, and you run a propane tank in the middle of summer, what does it form on the bottom? Ice. Ice. It's because we're evaporating refrigerant off the top of it. If you don't have enough air flow through that coil, it condenses, remember, and the ice, the condensate freezes. And once it freezes, what does it do? It just keeps making more ice. And so and they say, well, you got to thaw it out. Well, when it's iced up, is it picking up any heat from the house? No. So guess what's going back to the compressor? Liquid refrigerant. It's not gas because we're not evaporating in the evaporator. Mm -hmm. And you put liquid refrigerant in your compressor and you beat the valves out of it because liquid doesn't compress. So all these systems that they're putting in and they say, well, your system's only going to last five years or eight years or 10 years. So that's because you didn't have enough airflow to beat your compressor to death. And that's why it fails. If you have a unit that doesn't have enough airflow, you're shorting the life a huge amount. I have a neighbor behind me, I can look out my window and see it, and he has an air conditioner that was made in 1965, and it's still running. And when I first met him, I said, Dimitri, I've got to go see your duct system and stuff. And some did a beautiful job, and he has this literal 50, 60-year-old, almost 70-year-old air conditioner. No, it's not that old. It's 50-something years old. But they're never supposed to last that long, they put it. They will if everything's right. Right. Because nobody manufactures the radius ducts. 
That's why they're saying that. Well, they not very many do. So I mean, so you either make them yourself or you put turning veins in them. But if they design it with turning veins or design it with radius throat elbows, then that needs to be in there. So do you happen to have a picture of the like what the bottom side of the duct and the side of the duct would look like with those radius veins? Well, with the turning veins, yeah. I might have a picture. I'd have to look. Send me an email so I remember to look. Um, I could I could send you a picture of the turning veins I added to my own, but I can get you some. You know, here's a house that they you had to jump for the stairs. You know, it comes across, and then they jump for the stairs. Here's a bath fan that they put. The fan facing the wrong way, so you have to put a 180 degree turn on it right away. That's a home for special. That's all the time. Crap, we're supposed to be done, aren't we? I'm going to go a few more minutes. Return air means I'm just going to real quick just slow these up and tell you that you need to have transfer grills or some type of return from every bedroom. Um, so you should do one of these. How much air can you pull underneath the door? I'll show you this. They should have, if they do it right, they should have a lot. This is in manual D. If you have a master bedroom with three supplies, and then another one in the master bath, so it's a nice size bedroom, so you have four supplies, it's somewhere around 400 CFM, and the contractor tells you, I'm just going to draw the return under the door to get back to the central returns. It's right here in manual D. 400 CFM. What's the standard door? 2.6? 30 inches? 6.4 inches is what you have to cut off the bottom of the door. Their mouth drops when you tell them that, too. Yeah. Is this code? Yes. This is in manual D. It's right there. They, we had yeah. a guy years ago that we talked to Manuel J and D, and the, the furnace installer was so hell bent to see this point. They actually did one master return in the hallway and, and manufactured home cut in vents above the doors. And, and you know, it was a big house with a big system. I can only imagine how awesomely quiet that single massive return, return. in the center of the hall like a jet engine probably running when that sucker was on. And also they didn't have to do return there. It's the, the, yeah, it's so transfer grills return. I'm just gonna fly through flex duct. I see how it's squashed and kinked. Look at this, this is a beauty, isn't it? Their excuse is, is it's just the insulation, it's not the duct. Yeah. <laughs> well this isn't insulated and look what they did to it. Yeah. That's what the flex duct manufacturers say. You should, the diameter of the duct should also match. The, the turn can't be any tighter than that. If you don't spread it out all the way, your friction rate goes up four times if it's only 30% compressed. They can only sag a half inch per foot. We ever seen this? Uh, just on how to support it. Um, so manual D, you have this sheet. It talks a little bit about what you're supposed to be checking for. We do a total equivalent length. We start out, remember I said we start out around 0.7 or 0.8. Our coil, our filter, the grills, if there's some balancing dampers, we might use up half of uh, 0.5 inches and only gives us 20 inches, 0.2 inches left for our duct system. We could go on to here. This is the same thing that you have on every manual J. I'm, and the manual J will have this in there. We start out 0.85. All this stuff adds up to 0.44. And we have that available for return uh, for heating and cooling. And this duct system with turning veins has a total equivalent length of 309, the return is 312, and it's 621. So that same duct.
duct system that they're putting in this house, and you have a picture of it there with all the fittings. If they don't do it right, what do you think these numbers are? Double and triple. Double and triple. So it's not going to move any air. It's no different than a sprinkler system. It comes right down here. Not a great analogy. It's just like a freeway. We have this nice five lanes or something, and then we try to cram everything down. What happens when we lose one lane on the freeway? <laughs> but what's at the bottom of this? And Rysoft would do, did not do this in the past, but for this system, if you look at that chart that you have in there, here's our supplies. And it starts at the back end. We have a 4G, 80 feet, and a 8, 7, 30, and we go right on down the line, and they have all of everything listed. And on the return, they have everything listed. So it's printed here. It's printed out on the light duct layout. All we need is a representation of what those fittings are. I, uh, so is that what it shows on the bottom of your city inspector, what he has right here? So I just pull up the document. I okay. upload all of the documents in the I system. Start paying more attention to that because I, I've got all this in it, and I've never seen. If they the don't print, if they don't print this, then you need to ask for it. Yeah, I make them give me everything. Okay. A full manual. And, I mean, it's uh, they're usually hiring someone to do it, but then they don't install it the way that the guy designed the right. system. We're out of time. I wish we had a little bit more. Do you want some new inspections with me next week? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so here's what he was talking about. Here, see, we have all the fittings listed. AD. All the way through. 7A. Mm -hmm. That's printed out on the bottom of the sheet. And I can guarantee Then here's the sheet that shows the duct sizing, the supply and return, and branches, and... I wanted you to see this picture. This is what your air conditioning coil looks like inside your furnace. And you can see by the tight design, if you don't use the right coil, we're going to have a lot of pressure drop going through it. But if you use the right coil, we minimize the pressure drop. What's wrong with this picture? What's this left side of that plan I'm doing? It's laying right on that side of the coil. So that didn't work. Because air is supposed to go, air comes up through the bottom and goes both ways on that A coil. No air goes through the left side of that coil. That simply will not function. I caught it before they turned it on. But, um, doesn't work. This is an HVAC guy. Um, there's your, that's your manual. Let's sheet. read through it a little bit. Please feel free to, free to send me an email. I know as, as you start trying to enforce some of this stuff, you're going to have some challenges. Don't try to do the whole thing overnight. You know, start talking to the guys when they turn it in and you approve it. Say, hey, we're going to be looking for the fittings that are on your your design. I'm gonna, oh yeah. I'm gonna yeah. Let's see what. Let's see if we can get it right. Any other gonna, last minute questions gonna, before? Gonna, Thanks so much. I think you get it on the head. We as inspectors have to enforce it and teach why it's important. Yeah. Thanks so much. We'll see you later.